Okay, these are going to be the answers for the microeconomics part two study guide. Try to pay attention and follow along, and here we go. Uh, question number one, define the circular flow model. Basically, you need to know that it shows the flow of money, products, and resources that takes place in a market economy. Question number two, where uh, define the factor market, and that is where businesses buy the factors of production. You're going to find sell there, capital, entrepreneurship, land, and labor. Uh, define the product market. That's where you buy a good or a service. So that's the mall, the dentist office, Amazon.com, any of those things. Now, questions four, five, six, and seven deal with the flow map up at the top. Four asks you about the thick arrows on the outside circle. Now, based off how, how households, the arrow points from households, away from households, to the product market, we should know that that is uh, expenditures, okay? And how the arrow that is going towards households from the factor market, that should be income. So that's all money. So the outside arrows are all money, which means that the inside arrows are going to be resources, Number six says, next to each arrow in the diagram above, label what is happening to the flow of money and resources. So it flows like this. From households, you have expenditures to the product market. At the product market, that turns into business revenue for the businesses. The businesses then use that to pay for wages, interest, and net profits to the factor market, which then becomes income for the households. That's the outside arrows. Inside arrows goes the reverse direction. Households sell their productive resources to the factor market, which are then used as resources for businesses, which then make, um, businesses then make goods and services for the product market, and then those products are then bought by households. Okay, so that's the inside of the circular flow. Number seven says, identify the following on the circle above. Abby goes to the career fair to look for employment. Well, Abby's not employed, but she's selling some sort of a productive resource. So A is going to go uh, up from households to the factor market on the inside circle. B says Alex buys a new pair of shoes at Target. Okay, well, he's buying. That's the first verb. So from households, the arrow over to the product market, that's where B goes. C says, Target uses money from sales to buy new cash registers for its stores. Again, it's talking about money first. So businesses to the factor market, that arrow that goes from businesses to the factor market, outside money, C. D says, Mary works as an English teacher at a private school. Well, Mary has a job. Good job, Mary. Okay, and so from factor market, arrow to businesses, that's where D goes. And then lastly, Brian receives his paycheck from his job. Okay, so E is going to go from factor market, outside arrow to households. All right. For the chart 8 through 11, we've got monopoly, oligopoly, monopolistic competition, and pure competition. So some examples of monopoly, uh, government-sponsored monopolies, Georgia Power, Atlanta Watershed, the number of sellers that they have, just the one, and then ask if the products are standardized, differentiated, or both. In this case, it's a neither. That's why it's all X'd out. There is no competition in a monopoly, so it can't be standardized or differentiated because you only have the one choice. With oligopoly, remember that your book told you that oligopoly, you look to see if the top four businesses in that market own at least 60% of the market share. Right? That's like Coke and Pepsi, for an example. There are only a few sellers there. Remember, Oligos is Greek for a few. Now, are our products standardized, differentiated, or both? Here it's both. It depends on what industry the oligopoly is in. Okay, and then um, third is a monopolistic competition. That is any kind of hamburger place. Okay, burger restaurant, like farm burger, or grindhouse burgers, or McDonald's, or Burger King. There are many, many sellers there, and since they're all pretty much the same kind of thing, remember, mono means one, monopoly means one seller, monopolistic means one item or one kind of thing that's being competed against. So it's one kind of thing. You have to make it differentiated. You have to like find ways to say, hey, this hamburger is slightly better than the other hamburgers, okay, in whatever way that you decide to group all that stuff together. Now, pure competition, on the other hand, is 
things that you're going to find out of nature. Like a, a strawberry is a strawberry. A diamond is a diamond. Okay, the, the, like a tomato seller at a farmer's market is the same tomato essentially that you'll buy at the Kroger's or the DeKalb Farmer's Market or that guy that sells the tomatoes out of the back of his truck on the side of Memorial, right? And these are all standardized. They're standardized because they are exactly the same with very little variation. Now, when we're looking at these things, again, remember, monopoly, there's no competition, okay? Second chart. 12 through 15, no competition. Monopoly has the most control over the prices because they have no competition. They get to set it however they want. Think of the EpiPen there for a while where the EpiPen was very expensive, but there was no competition. Or uh, the Pharma Bro guy that sold, was it Martin Screlly? He, he was selling the, uh, the, the drug for 65% markup rate. Uh, so, so there's that. And you can get away with it because, you know, there was no competition there. Um, so you have that kind of stuff. But it's very hard to break into competition with these kind of monopolies. It's, uh, it's, it's almost impossible. Oligopoly, on the other hand, remember, oligos means few. Okay, there's a little bit of competition uh, in between Coke and Pepsi, right? The, the number of sellers... Um, control over price is a lot. Like Pepsi and, and Coca-Cola are always relatively the same price, but because they kind of have this agreement with each other about you know production costs and, and, and not undercutting the other person, but still making a tidy profit. It's hard to enter into those businesses. Like if you look at, say, gosh, uh, washers and dryers, okay? You're going to have about... 13 firms in that market, but the top four corporations in that in that selling group control like 93% of the income generated. Uh, same with, say, like aircraft carriers. There's 184 uh, companies, not aircraft carriers, but aircraft, 184 companies that make aircraft. Now, of those 184, you know, the top four, per, four, top four companies account for 81% of the revenue generated of the business. So that's pretty substantial. Okay, so it's something to think about when it comes to, uh, you know, how to enter into a, the business or who controls those prices. A monopolistic competition, on the other hand, there is a lot of competition for that. And you can just go for days and days and days to see, like, who, um, who, who has a burger joint. Right, they're all over the place. They're regional, like uh, sodas, uh, you know, uh, are can be oligopoly, right? But let's say you take Coke and Pepsi out of the equation. Well, then there's a lot of competition for that because there's tons of soda everywhere. But burger joints is usually the the one that we use the the most as far as hey, they're 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 all over the place. You can enter in. Anybody can like pass the. The, the health code uh, permits and, and, and get all the stuff set up to make a burger joint and, and enter in. And Pepsi, or not Pepsi, uh, McDonald's and, and Hardee's and, and Chick-fil-A, they can't stop you from entering into that kind of stuff. There's little control over the price. That's why when you go to Farm Burger, it's a different price to buy that burger than if you buy a quarter pounder with cheese over at McDonald's. Grindhouse burgers, again, they're not very standardized. They're, since they're differentiated, you're going to have uh, a little control over price, and, uh, but not a giant gap because supply and demand, and consumers will only pay so much for a product. And the ease to enter then into the market, it's pretty easy, right? You want to have a burger place, fill out the forms, get the permits for businesses, uh, make sure that when the health code comes over, you, know, the, you pass that, and you're good to go. Uh, and snack bar, great example. Now, pure competition has the most competition, and there is almost no control over price, none. It's, it is exactly supply and demand, right? And uh, the ease to enter the market is the easiest. I mean, if you can grow strawberries, right, you can go and sell those strawberries in the back of a truck on the side of the road, or you could say, hey, come to my strawberry farm and give me X amount of dollars and you can go pick strawberries to your heart's content. So that's basically those charts, 8 through 15, 
what to put there. Okay, so number 16, define technological monopoly. That's where a firm controls a fat manufacturing method or an invention or a type of technology. So like Polaroid is an example of that. The EpiPen is an example of that. Now they get away with it because usually they hold a patent. That's an exclusive property right to an invention process for a certain number of years. And usually at most it's about 20 years depending on what kind of patent that you get. Now you have things called geographic monopolies. That's there are no other producers in that region. So like your only gas station around, the Valero by Decatur High School, that's by the train tracks. If you're going to Edgewood, that's the only gas station that you're going to see for a while. So if you don't get gas, you're in a lot of trouble. Now, a natural monopoly occurs when the cost of productions are the lowest with only one producer. So a utility company, water, power. Okay, and They get away with this based off of a, a concept called economies of scale. And that refers to reduced costs per unit that happen when the increased total output of a product uh, is, is cheaper. So a large factory will produce power tools at a lower unit price. The larger the company, the cheaper their production costs, the bigger the profits to send to consumers, possibly. But also, too, if it's a, a government-sponsored monopoly uh, where the government runs the business and authorizes only one producer, then... They don't worry about the profit. They just pass those savings along to the buyers. That's why your water bill is not ridiculously expensive. Now, sometimes in the market economy, you have two companies, two firms that join together. They, that's a merger. So with number 22, define merger. That's the joining of two firms to form a single firm. So when Disney bought out Pixar, that was a merger. Right now, the Disney-Fox merger is all in the news, and if you can't listen to, like, well, will Wolverine appear in Avengers Endgame? Well, that depends on you know how the merger's going. If the merger hasn't been allowed to happen yet, then probably not. But the merger wasn't fast because the government wanted to make sure that the merger of Disney and Fox didn't create an entertainment monopoly that would benefit uh, Disney and squash the competition. And a regulation, on the other hand, is, is, is why that happens. They're controlling business behavior through a set of rules or laws. So a good example of that is the Sherman Antitrust Act. Now, there was a need for that because in the past, Standard Oil, which was led by J.D. Rockefeller, competed unfairly. Like He had ruthless business practices, and it often led to a limited supply at very high prices because there was no competition. So what the government did was they busted up Standard Oil through Ida Tarbell, who muckrakered uh, yellow journalism, uh, went there and kind of led the crusade against them. And so they busted Standard Oil up into little companies. They were called the Baby Standards. So AT&T became a monopoly, and in, I think, 1982, they were busted up themselves, and they had different uh, regions that you um, they had control over. And... Parts of AT&T eventually became what's known as Verizon today, and other parts came uh, back to AT&T once they had the iPhone and had that capital to, to go on and merge back in. But they never have gotten back the entire company that they used to have. In fact, right now, most of that company that was busted up became essentially two companies, Verizon and AT&T in today's uh, cellular technology companies. So the purpose of the whole Sherman Antitrust Act was to give government permission to regulate trusts, regulate monopolies and cartels. They basically start to promote competition in the marketplace. Because remember, competition breeds innovation, right? Monopolies are horrible when it comes to breeding innovation because there's no reason to innovate. No, don't have to worry about making your product a little different or, or a little bit better because no one is threatening you. But if you have that constant thing of, hey, I need to get a leg up in my uh, competition, then you're going to add stuff. That's why we have power windows in cars, whereas before they didn't. It was one other thing that they could use to differentiate the cars. A uh, great example of why that doesn't work with competition is you look at the Lada in the Soviet Union. The Lada didn't have any competition and is widely regarded as some of the worst, uh, one of the worst cars ever manufactured. Now, um, the next few questions are some commissions, and some agencies, administrations, and stuff like that. You should know what these are, even though I'm not going to test 
you on them uh, on this next test. But they're important. So, like, you've got the Federal Trade Commission. They're the ones that are looking, like, at the Disney-Fox merger. They're enforcing those antitrust laws. They, they monitor unfair business practices, which is one of the reasons why Scully eventually goes to prison uh, because, you know, the, he was being investigated, and, and the FTC had something to do with that. Okay, so, and, and also deceptive advertising. You know, they don't allow that. Um, the purpose of the Environmental Protection Agency, we're trying to protect our health by enforcing environmental laws regarding pollution and hazardous materials. Uh, you know, it'd be interesting for you to take a, a, a pause right now and to go look and see what is the EPA doing with Flint, Michigan, you know, and, and how can we make this better? The next is the purpose of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. And it sets the safety standards for thousands of types of consumer products. So, uh, you know, I'm always on the lookout for, like, recalls on unsafe products when it comes to, like, baby things. Because, you know, I have three kids and I want to make sure that they're okay. And, and nothing that's been put out there has actually been proven to be unsafe. So they they are recalling some of these things. And that happens from time to time. And, in, and when you turn 16 you have a car, that's another thing that you should pay attention to. Because sometimes, like, seat belts or brakes or, or certain tires have recalls. And if you're not keeping up with that, it could put you at some danger. And so that's one of the things that the CPSC is really good about protecting against. Next is the Food and Drug Administration that protects consumers for unsafe foods, drugs, cosmetics, requires labels with product information. Uh, that kind of comes about, again, with the yellow journalism. You had Upton Sinclair that wrote this book called The Jungle, talking about the meat industry and where they would pack this meat, and it would just oh, horrible conditions. And, like, I mean, this was back before the days of, like, our Freon refrigeration and so some of that meat would spoil they'd grind it up anyway and send it off and Upton Sinclair was writing about those things about uh, also the conditions that the workers were in and he's quoted as saying that he was trying to hit America in the heart but ended up hitting them in the stomach and so the you know the FDA comes out from that uh, drugs that come out uh, you know they're rigorously uh, it's just raked over the coals with the FDA to make sure that it's not going to be harmful to human beings there are safety trials and all kinds of things that kind of go there. Also, there's the Securities and Exchange Commission that regulates markets for stocks and bonds to protect their investors. Very important, right? Um, you know, those of you that are doing the stock market game, the SEC is super, super pivotal in all of those things. And again, with Screlly, that's another thing that probably got him there as well. Now, Going back, these next bits will be on the test, so make sure you know them. So if we're going to define a sole proprietorship, this business organization, that is a business owned and managed by a single person. Ann's snack bar was owned by Ann. It was her deal. She didn't have anybody else investing in it. She didn't have a partner for the longest time. So that was all hers and all of her risk, all of her liability, but also all of her profit. Now, if she had decided to, to have a partnership, that would have been different. Eddie's Attic in Decatur is a partnership. It's a business that's co-owned by two or more people who agree on how to, uh, the responsibilities and the profits and the losses will be divided. Uh, important to note here is it's two or more, and it's privately owned. Okay, So it's, it's owned by individuals, and it's not publicly traded. So like Chick-fil-A is also a kind of an idea of, a, of partnerships. You buy into that privately owned business. And that's how you, you own a Chick-fil-A. Now, you get a corporation. That's where it's a, a business owned by shareholders or stockholders. Corporations are usually public where you can buy and sell unless you, you, you do uh, you know, very specific kinds of corporations like an S-Corp. But even then, you can sell those stocks. People just tend to not um, on the smaller end of it. Uh, larger ends like McDonald's as a corporation or or Walmart as a corporation, you can buy stock in these. Coca Cola is a corporation. You can buy stock in that oligopoly, uh, you know. And because it's an oligopoly, again, the risk of it folding is usually pretty low, so you don't have that huge boost in the um, you know reward of of the the risk that you take by lending capital to that that place. So the similarities between sole proprietorship and partnerships they are easy to open. There are very few uh, government re regulations, but there's a limited life. Like, like, you know, when the owner dies, usually the business dies. When the partners die, usually the, unless they keep going through partners, there's like a law firm where they just kind of keep uh, evolving, uh, you know, it, it'll, it'll only last a certain amount of time. 
but there's also unlimited liability. Now you can do in in partnerships, you can do some some limited liability, but that's not usually the case. More often than not, partnerships and sole proprietorships are really completely at at risk for liability. So it's unlimited. Now, here are how our uh, corporations and partnerships are different. Okay, so you've got corporations that are professional managers. They have limited liability, the unlimited life, and high startup. Disney's going to be around forever, guys. It's just how that is. But to to start up a corporation, you're going to have to raise a lot of capital, and that's why they do the public trading of the stocks and, and, and the shares like that. Um, <clears throat> there's heavy regulation. There's double taxation. This is very important. And there's loss of control. One of the reasons why Chick-fil-A has not gone public is because there are certain ideals that they want to uphold for example, always being closed on Sunday. Well, if you go public and you have a board of directors and, and, and these kinds of guys making the decisions, they could very easily decide, hey, we really like that burger money or chicken burger money, and, and we like to just open up um, and give people waffle fries uh, for cost on Sundays. And then because it's publicly traded, the, the people that started the company wouldn't have anything to say about that. And so that loss of control is, is one of the things that corporations have. Now, partnerships, in other words, have a potential for conflict, joint decision-making, and specialization. So, you know, the cool thing about having a partner is you can focus on one thing while the partner fo- focuses on a different other aspect of the business. Um, it's, let's, when we're looking at liability, is it better to have limited liability or unliability? Well, if we had to choose between limited liability and unlimited liability, of course we want limited because if someone sues for damages against a corporation, the money they receive can only come from the corporation. The individuals who own or work for it cannot be sued. So if you own stock in Coca-Cola and they find that if you, uh, Coca-Cola is too acidic and, and can destroy uh, uh, the health hazards and, and, and our environment, well, you're only out the money that you've sunk into Coca-Cola. They can't take your house or cars or, or any of your property you know, that, that you have to use to repay some of these debts back. Only what you've put in. On the other hand, if you have, un, if you have unlimited liability, they can get all of it. You can go penniless. Now, the next couple of things is the difference between price and non-price competition. Now, price competition is you emphasize the price of the product. So if they're mentioning price in any way, shape, or form, like if, if uh, Walmart's like, hey, we will match any price from Amazon.com if you're a member or if it's directly sold by a place, because they're talking about price, that's price competition. Non-price competition, on the other hand, is exactly like our demand determinant, uh, the shifter of consumer taste. It emphasizes the quality and the characteristics of the product. So you're going to have advertising, celebrity endorsements, free gifts, that kind of stuff. All of these things kind of go along with non-price competition. Uh, one, of the, one of the fun things in the late 80s, early 90s was that Pepsi was trying to sell itself as a youth product. And so Pepsi would have like Britney Spears, back when Britney Spears was like 17, 18 years old, yeah, like singing and, and drinking a Pepsi and, and, and all these high school kids and, and young college kids were shown like having fun while, yes, drinking a Pepsi. And that's because they were trying to show that the youth should drink Pepsi, the choice of, the, of the, the new generation, I believe it was called. But the idea here is that they were using non-price competition to draw in uh, people to drink their, their, their drinks. Uh, now, all this is microeconomics, okay? So the study of economic behavior and decision-making by smaller units of the economy, such as individual households and business firms, right? So like we will examine how decisions affect pricing and the supply and demand of goods and services in individual markets. So you know, like the pizza market is something. The private jet market is another thing. Hamburgers are, are something, it's also the same thing. It's like these individual markets. So we can look at how price affects that, and we could look at how like non-price competition can shift those determinants right, and affect the whole cost in that one particular industry. That's microeconomics because the business of those industries. Now, we go into macro when we look at the economy as a whole and all industries together. That's something totally different. Microeconomics is only about 
households and business firms and single industries, not the economy as a whole nation. All right? So these are the answers of the study guide. Hope that you got something out of this. Uh, Keep studying. Look at your notes. And good luck. Godspeed. And I'll see you on the other side.